So Matt, thank you so much for joining us on our debut show and congratulations on breaking such a big story. Thanks for being with us. No, of course. I'm very glad to be on the debut show. This is it's exciting for me. Yeah, it was supposed to be the first ever interview you've done since the Twitter files. You cheated on us at the last second once for Russell Brand, but we're still extremely excited to have you. At least you cheated on a, another Rumble show, so we're happy about that. So let me start by asking you, um, you know, you've obviously been an extremely busy journalist over the past seven days. You've reported on an enormous amount of information. I know from having been involved in stories uh, where that is is where that happens that I always like being asked by journalists, what are the two or three most significant revelations you were able to report? Because sometimes it is hard for the public to process so much information. So let me begin by asking you that question. What do you consider to be the, fur, the, the top three, say, revelations of, of what you've shown? Well, I, uh, num number one for me definitely is, you know, the first time that we saw emails that said, concretely or not even emails slacks that said the fbi flagged this for us the dhs flagged this for us and we were able to follow the thread of you know basically requests for moderation from the government and seeing how that process worked on the back end we're still working out the whole mechanics of it but basically the the fact that the government is now provably in the business of monitoring speech at a pretty micro level uh, and flagging it for moderation, I, I, I think that's the biggest uh, news that we've broken uh, so far. Uh, there's obviously other stuff in there and we're, we're starting to get the outlines of some things that are really interesting. Um, also, I would say the, the thing that Barry covered uh on day two you're talking about barry the weiss the other reporter who reported the story yeah barry weiss she the second installment of the twitter files was about what norm, most people would call shadow banning what they call visibility filtering which we've learned a lot about and you know she, she published among other things uh, a big screenshot of an account that just has a notation on it that says trends blacklist right so you can see that they have an enormous uh range of, of they have basically total ability to control how visible one person or one account is versus another and so we, we they can no longer say they don't do that I want to focus on the first part of that answer for just a second, because if I had to name the most significant revelation, I would also name that one, namely the very direct, ongoing, and regular participation of the U.S. security state in this process of having private companies decide what information we get. Shortly before you began doing this reporting, Ken Klippenstein and Lee Fong got a hold of documents at The Intercept showing that Homeland Security has a major plan, much of which they've implemented, to insinuate themselves into that process. And now we have you're being able to show that not only is there this open communication, but you know you you also were able to show that Yoel Roth, one of the chief censors at Twitter, was almost gleeful about how frequently he was meeting with representatives yeah. of the FBI and Homeland Security. Why do you consider that so significant? Why should people care about that? Because it had only been speculated about before, uh, what we're what we're seeing, and uh, there's there's a huge difference between, let's say, the FBI meeting regularly with the the head of trust and safety at um, at Twitter and making recommendations in a general way. Um, there's a big difference between that and what is actually happening, which is this huge in bulk operation of reports that are coming from a number of agencies asking for things to well they're they're not at, we don't know how the ask works yet but they're definitely flagging things for for moderation and we're seeing how that works so rather than be it being speculative now we now know the government is in the business of mass censoring essentially so as you probably have heard there were some criticisms of you being voiced among your fellow colleagues in the media profession and and others and one of those was all sorts of 
wild conspiracy theories about the conditions to which they believed you must have agreed or that were imposed unilaterally by Elon Musk in order for you to do the reporting. One of those conditions you've acknowledged and was very obvious was that he wanted this reporting to be done on his platform and part of his effort to make Twitter a place where reporting is done. Others that people just asserted were things like you were paid by him, he told you what you can and can't say, he gave you certain kinds of access but not others. Are any of those things true? What were these conditions beyond the requirement that this be published in the first instance on Twitter? Yeah, I, I outlined this on my site last night. There were two conditions. One of them was an attribution, um, sources of Twitter, and the other one was it has to be done on Twitter. So that's it. And I was I was actually hesitant about the Twitter aspect of it because I'm a writer. I like doing long form and explaining things, but um, I, I actually think it wouldn't work otherwise. And there's also uh, a sort of delicious irony to using Twitter to basically defenestrate Twitter uh, and then also to sort of drop this enormous fetid uh, stink bomb in the middle of what used to be the private garden of mainstream journalists. Um, it, it wouldn't have had the same impact if it had been done anywhere else. Well, let me ask you about the, the just one. <laughs>